Good afternoon. It's wonderful to be with you. We're looking forward to our time together. We want to talk today about a very important subject. It's important in our home, isn't it, dear? Very important. Journey. What do you think about a journey? You like to be successful in your journeys? You like to get where you're going? And you like to get there without any broken hearts, right? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about those special relationships that all of our young people will experience probably eventually if time should last and how we can make this journey together with no broken hearts. That sound good? No broken hearts. And we're going to talk about how we can guide and work with our young people so that not only will they not experience a broken heart, but that God doesn't experience a broken heart. Do you think God cares about that? Amen. We don't want to break God's heart. And do you think parents want to have our hearts broken? No. And so we don't want any broken-hearted parents. We don't want any broken-hearted young man being involved in a relationship with our daughters or any broken-hearted daughters in our family being in relationship with a young man that's inappropriate. And last of all, if we're not going to experience a broken heart, then there needs to be a cooperation between parents and God and our young people. And that's what we're going to talk about today, a journey to an unbroken heart. We'd like to look at three areas in an overview that we want to talk about that has helped us in our home because we are in this process presently. We have three young adults in our family, and it's, it's exciting to know that if we are willing to go to the Word of God and if we're willing to be hearers and doers of the Word, that God will personally help each one of us to direct us as parents, to direct our young people as they grow and mature in life. So we want to look at three basic areas. The first of area that we'd like to discuss today is that of honoring God. If we don't want to have a broken heart, we need to understand how to honor God. That means in that relationship to God that our young people will be respectable and respecting young people. They will respect and honor their parents as well. Then we want to define love practically. In society today, there's a tremendous misunderstanding, a, a deception of what love is. We want to look at what love is really defined and show how it operates principally in a relationship. And then lastly, we want to look at guidelines that will help us as parents, help our young people, our young adults, as they enter into these relationships, guidelines that will help to direct to keep that relationship uh, pure and holy and honorable before the Lord and have no broken hearts. So let's talk about honoring God first. Because if we are Christians, then that's the first relationship that we need to be developing with our young people. If our young people don't honor God, how can we expect them to honor us as parents? How can we expect them to honor another young person? That's the first place we need to start, honoring God. Because when we develop this relationship with our young people, when they learn to honor God, we can expect every other relationship to be deep, lasting, and beautiful. Both the Old and New Testaments clearly lay out what it means to honor God. And we want to look first, if you have your Bibles open to Matthew 22, Matthew 22, verse 37. It says there, as Jesus himself spoke these words, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy what? Heart. With all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Right. So what's left there? Anything left out? So we're talking here about wholehearted commitment to God. Now, verse 38 says, This is the first and great commandment. The first and great commandment. Should this then be for us as parents, 
the first area that we develop in our young people. Now, do we, do, do we wait till they're in their teenage years to begin thinking about this? What do you think? No. Now, we need to be developing this in them as they grow, as they grow in their years. This is the first and great commandment. And then, of course, Exodus in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 3, says, Thou shalt have how many other gods before me? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So when you really, truly love someone, and this is what we're talking about, learning to love and honor God, right? We want to spend time with them. So this is very important as we help our young people to develop that relationship with Christ, that they learn how to spend meaningful time with their Lord and Savior. Secondly, it means if you really love someone, that you respect them. I really love my husband, and I respect him highly. I, in fact, recently I said, you're the most honorable man I've ever met. That's what I put in my little note, because that's how I feel, and that's the way a wife should feel about her husband, right? And that love nurtures respect. That love nurtures that honoring, and so also our relationship with God. We will develop a respect for his word, and we will desire with our heart to honor him. So will our young people desire from their heart, not because they have to, but because they want to honor God. It comes from having this relationship with him. And so that relationship means that time, and as we develop that with our young people, that open communication, open communication between them and God, and open communication in our home, our young people with us as their parents. Honesty of heart. This is very important, to have the honesty of heart, even if you don't really think your parents, young people, really want to hear what you have to say. It's better to say it and to be honest and open with them to tr than to try to keep it back to say, well, I'm not sure they'd really want to hear this at this point. Helping our young people, guiding them in building this relationship with God in communication with Him and communication in our home is our work as parents. It's our first work. And if that is not in place, how can our young people enter successfully into a relationship with someone else. So the next area you want to talk about is after honoring God, working with them and honoring God, this prepares the way for them to honor who next? Who do you think? Parents, okay? If, if we're really honoring God as young people, and I still feel a responsibility to honor my father, okay? Amen. My father is now getting to the age where it's difficult for him take care of himself as well as he used to. It's a difficult time for him. It's a difficult time for me. You know, I have my son who's, who's away at, at flight school, and, you know, to be pulled between the needs that I have for working with my son at long distance and the needs of working with my father, there's a pull. I want my son to honor me as his father, and I want to honor my father, my earthly father, and we never outgrow that, do we? Amen. We never will outgrow that. There isn't a point at which we, we don't need to honor our parents. So honoring God prepares us to be honorable towards our parents and towards that special person that God may have for our young people. Without this, without the honor of God, without the honoring of parents, our young people are unprepared to go into any other relationship outside of the home. Amen. Because a true relationship with God will always lead to honoring parents. Don't ever think anything else. If, if your young people are not honoring you as parents, don't think for a moment that they really are honoring God. The two go hand in hand. Amen. If our young people are honoring God, they will honor us as their parents. If they are not honoring us, it's because they're not honoring God and vice versa. So <clears throat> if we have that true relationship with God, it will lead to putting his word, his principles above feelings, emotions, and yes, even impressions. Okay? Okay. Some people say, I've heard young people say, well, the Lord impressed this on me. Oh, the Lord impressed upon you that you could go against your parents? Yes, the Lord impressed that on me. God's word will always be placed above emotions, feelings, and impressions. Amen. 
I want to share a simple story with you. A couple that we met a few years ago at a camp meeting setting like this. And they approached me after one of the meetings and they wanted to talk. They were very much in love with each other. And they approached me because the young man had gone to her parents and had asked for the hand of this young lady. And the parents said, no. You understand that? <laughs> no. Well, these, these parents, you know, they were, they were of a different religious background. And so they were struggling. They were really struggling because they loved each other. They wanted to be married. And so this had happened just a short time before the, the camp. And so we were talking together. And he said, what do you think? You think I should honor these parents when they don't even believe like we believe? And I said, my friend, I know this is a difficult thing right now with all that you're feeling. And I said, if this is God, if, if you really love this young lady and God is really in this relationship, then you need to honor her parents. Amen. And I said, I can't tell you how it will happen, but I said, if God is in this and you are willing to honor her parents, God will work some way. He has a thousand ways we know not of. Amen. God will work. Two years later, at another camp like this, they were all excited and came to share their testimony about how God had worked. Amen. And about how they now had the full blessing of those unbelieving parents. And he said two years later, now two years down the road, he said, you know, we weren't ready to get married two years ago. And we have learned a lot of things about ourselves. And you know, he said, it gave an opportunity for her parents to find out about me. And now they trust me. Amen. Now they feel they can count on me and that they can give their daughter to me. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. God has his ways if we will work within his principles. Honor thy father and thy mother will always happen when we are honoring our heavenly father. Amen. Jesus reinforces this again by his own words found in Matthew chapter 15, verses 4 through 6. He talks about the importance of us honoring our father and mother. But then it's interesting, as you, as you read through that, you find that he's talking about those traditions of men, the traditions of society, of our culture, of our times, that come into disregard the law of God. In other words, looking for a way around it. And he says that this doesn't do away with the fact that we need to honor our parents, that young people need to honor their parents, that we need to honor our parents. So I got to thinking, what are some of those things that we have today in our society, our culture, that may, even in a Christian nation, may begin to unravel or disregard or cause the thought to disregard a clear, thus saith the Lord. Anybody have any ideas? I'll tell you the first one that came to me. When you're 18, you can do what you want. You're a free adult according to, you know, the laws of the land. And it doesn't matter what anybody says. When you're 18, you can make all your own choices. Is that, does that agree with the word of God? And yet, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that in the Christian church. Even by adults telling this to young people or young people telling each other, hey, when I'm 18, I can make my own decisions. It doesn't matter what mom and dad says anymore. Does it? What does God say? Honor thy father and thy mother. So we have to really tune in to what the Lord says in his word. This is why it's so important to have that relationship with him and be studiers of the word of God. And when we do that, to believe what it says. It's very plain. It's very simple. A little child can understand. It's not philosophical. It is absolutely simplistic. And we have to learn how to be willing to allow God to help us to accept it with a plain thus saith the Lord so that it becomes the rule of our life. Other areas that we find that begin to 
cause this area to get gray is that young people in their teenage years should just go out and start dating because that's what everybody does, right? Is it? Well, that's what a lot of people are doing, but is that right? And what are those associations or relationships consisting of? Almost always things that aren't real to life, right? They're always going to parties and socials and recreations and out to dinner. I mean, I don't go out to dinner, you know, every time I'm with my husband. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's not real life situations. It's all, shall we say, a near facade that, that gets young people acquainted in a false setting that when they and if they should get married and they enter into real life, they've never learned how to interact in real life situations because everything they've done has been a party and a game. And so we have to look at these things and, and even the relationship, those young ages. When, you, when you're in your teen years, just because you hit 18 or you're 16 or you're 19, maybe even 20, doesn't mean that you've arrived and now you have all this great wisdom because there's a lot of changes that begin to happen, a lot of maturing uh, that goes on during those years. And so it's better if we help our young people to mature in those areas without putting the burden or giving them the, the freedom, shall we say, to just to go off and ha enter into all kind of relationships, which end up with many broken hearts. And I'm sure there are many people here today who are parents who've been through that themselves and know it's a very painful thing. And that really is what paves the way for divorce today. You, you try this one out, it doesn't work. You get that one, it doesn't work. Well, you know. And when you get into a marriage, that's still, that's your habit. That's how you, you're used to relating. And so if you run into some bumps and some difficulties, the tendency is to want to pull away and find somebody better. And that's, that's a deadly um, training, isn't it? And that's why the Lord is, gives our young people, one of the reasons is to protect them from damaging their lives, from causing bro broken hearts in, their, in the future. When we look at the scripture, we find many beautiful illustrations. And I would encourage you, young people, you youth, you young adults, you parents, especially those parents here today who are finding themselves with young people in the ages that they're looking to develop these relationships to go back and find these principles actually lived out through the scriptures. And I think of the book of Ruth. That's where my mind first went. Here's Ruth and Naomi. You all remember the story. Naomi lost her son. Ruth lost her husband. And Ruth, who was, who was born and raised, shall we say, in a heathen land, she learned how to honor God through the influence of her mother-in-law and her husband. Now her husband has, is gone from her, and now she still has that influence of her mother-in-law. And she's learned how not only to honor God, but she's also learned how to honor her mother-in-law. And you remember the story. She says, I'll go back with you. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. And everything in that book shows how she honored Naomi and every decision. She was an adult. She could make her own decisions. She'd already been married once. But she went, and she listened, and she was willing to hear the counsel and the guidance of wisdom. And God blessed that. God blessed that and in, in brought through that relationship the promised Messiah through that lineage. So we can learn much through the scriptures. It's beautiful there in Ruth 3, verse 5. <clears throat> she says, all that thou sayest unto me. This is a grown woman, okay? All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Isn't that beautiful? There is no point at which we stop being obedient and honoring our parents. You know, when it says in Ephesians 6, 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, if you think, children, if you think that that means that you only obey your parents, and this is what a lot of young people today believe, this is a popular belief today, that that means that I'm a child until I'm 18 because the state says I'm 18, I'm an adult. Or maybe it's 21, I'm an adult. Well, maybe it's 25 when I can rent a car. <laughs> That's what happened on our honeymoon. 
went on this wonderful honeymoon and I had to rent bikes because they wouldn't rent me a car. <laughs> so I'm supposed to be an adult, 20, almost 24 years old, and they said, sorry, you're not old enough to rent a car yet. <laughs> so, young people, you're always going to be the children of your parents, right? Amen. I am still my father's child. Now, I don't want to overemphasize this, but there is a great lack. And I want to say today there is a, there is a divisive power, divisive power from the devil trying to break down the fabric of family today, trying to dis destroy families and divide and conquer. So... Let's look at another example. You know, it's fun to go to the Bible and take old stories and bring new blessings out of them. Amen. Solomon and Bathsheba. 2 Kings, the second chapter and the 19th and 20th verses. Notice how Solomon deals with his mother, Bathsheba. We're talking about honor thy father and thy mother, the first commandment with promise. It says here, the king rose up to meet her. This is very interesting. If you know anything about how Solomon was treated as a king, he was the most powerful king that ever sat on a throne, earthly-wise, okay? When people came into Solomon's presence, there was a ritual that they went through. Solomon did not rise off his throne. Notice what he does here for his mother. The king rose up to meet her, and she sat at his right hand, we're told. And then in verse 20, he says this to his mother. Ask on, my mother. He opening himself up. Mm -hmm. Ask on, my mother, for I will not say thee nay. Now think about this for a moment. This is the king, a very wealthy king in a very strong kingdom. And he says to his mother, ask me what you want to ask me. I won't say no to you. I mean, there's just a lot of significance. We could go into the whole story of what's significant about Solomon's mother sitting in his right hand and what God says to us about sitting on the right hand of Christ. Mm -hmm. But here she is sitting on his right hand. He says, ask me whatever you want. I won't say no to you. This is honor, isn't it? But if you read the rest of the story, which we're not here to go into the whole rest of the story, but do you know she asked something that wasn't from her heart? She asked something from his brother. A wife that she could not really legitimately, he couldn't ask this wife of Solomon. And Solomon recognized what was behind that request. And he said, give her this, Give him this woman and he, give him half of my kingdom, right? Solomon did not grant his mother's request because the request that she made did not come from principle and it did not come from her own heart. She was put up to it in her weakness by another son. Isn't that interesting? But notice how Solomon honors her even in how he has to say no to her he still honors her. So, let's make one thing clear. Honoring does not always mean saying yes, does it? Honoring is how we relate to our parents and how our parents relate to us. We have a responsibility as parents in how we relate to our children. Our children have a responsibility in how they relate to us. Mm -hmm. Honor thy father and thy mother. In this building the relationship and helping our young people learn to honor us, one of the most effective ways we found is good communication in the home. And while we talk about good communication, you know, we find sometimes that it can be a trial, a struggle, a difficulty, a challenge. Have you ever experienced that? I, know. I mean, you want to have good communication at all times, under all circumstances, but there's sometimes that the communication can be quite challenged. But if we are willing to really listen to the Lord, to tune in to Him, and to let Him subdue our hearts and recognize what He is trying to help us to understand 
in responding to our young people, responding to our young adults, responding to our children, whatever age they may be, God can take even some of the most difficult communication and he can make it a blessing. Mm -hmm. But because if you've had difficulty, if you've hit some of those bumps in your communication, don't give up. Just persevere longer and break past that. Look for ways to break past that and to deepen that communication between your young people and yourself. And young people, look for the ways that you can break past that. If your parents make a mistake, have a forgiving spirit and give them the opportunity again to express themselves and have hearts to hear and a willing spirit to listen. You know, one of the best things we can do, parents, if we want to have our young people respect us. It's like in the marriage. If I want my dear wife to submit, that's what verse 22 says in Ephesians 5, right? This is not a marriage message. But if I want my wife to submit, then it's a lot nicer if I love her as Christ loved the church, which is verse 25, right? Does it make it easier for my wife to submit? Oh, yes. <laughs> it's not an excuse, though, not to no, submit, No, it's right? not. <laughs> Neither is it an excuse for our young people not to honor us as parents, but parents, why not give them the best opportunity to want to honor us and communicate with us? So one of the things that we have done through the years with our young people is we have said, you can talk to us about anything. Did I just say that? Anything. As long as you talk to us in a respectful manner. Okay? That means they can't be, it works both ways, doesn't mm -hmm. it? They can't be yelling at us, and we really can't be yelling at them, right? But we can talk about anything in the home, even if it's uncomfortable, even if we totally agree with it, disagree with it, or agree with it, but totally disagree with it, we can talk about it, and we will listen and discuss it, and not just react to it. So if you want your children to talk, and you want them to open up, and you don't want them to go behind your back, and you don't want them to go somewhere else, then give them the opportunity to talk to you, even if it's hard. And they will, even if it's hard. We've had some very hard communication over the years, haven't we, dear? Yes, and we've had some very happy communication. Most of it years. has been very happy over the years. We have a very happy home, and I'm thankful that I can say that with an open heart today. But it doesn't happen by accident. It won't happen. A happy marriage doesn't happen by accident. We have to be willing to talk about hard things in a marriage, and we have to be willing to talk about hard things in parent-child relationships. But you know, most of our experience has been letting them talk about all the things that they want to talk about that's important, and we're talking about it now in terms of relationships. Okay, so get from your young people what's important to them. What do you think you want to find in a young man or in a young woman? What are the important character attributes? And really begin talking about what they're looking for and guide that thought process. Sometimes the questions may come, like one young lady said, well, I want to have a boyfriend. She was 14 years old. I want to have a boyfriend. She's very open about it. Thankful we never got that question at that age. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but it, it happens. I mean, oh, it's, yes. it's very real. And how do we respond? You know, where do we take them? No, you can't do that. Don't you know that's not right? Or you're too young for that. How do we communicate about this? Well, why would you want to have a boyfriend? Well, because my best friend has one. In fact, this is the second one she's had, and she's only 14. Two. I mean, she can do it. All my other classmates are doing it at school. You see where the reasoning happens? We have to take them out of what everybody else is doing because we can't be patterning our homes and our young people's future off of what everybody else is doing around us. Amen. We have to be patterning after what God has to say. There's an interesting little sentence in the book, Messages to Young People. And of course, this book is designed to reach the hearts of young people. It's designed to be uh, expressing principles, Christian principles, to help young people be successful in this life. Page 452, it says, A youth, 
Of course, that can be defined as, say, a teenager, a youth, not yet out of his teens, there's the definition, is a poor judge of the fitness of a person as young as himself to be his companion for life. Well, Mom, I don't want him to be my companion. I just want to date him. <laughs> well, why would you want to do that? I mean, why would you want to get all emotionally involved in somebody and then you have no interest in them? Why would you want to waste? Because sometimes they never think it through. You're just doing it because that's what everybody else does. And again, many of us as adults have been through that and we know the, some of the scars that we've come out with, right? And we can thank the Lord that he had mercy and, uh, and I thank the Lord as an adult today, and I have for many, many years, that I listened to my parents. I listened three different times, and three different times I was spared um, an awful, you know, outcome of my future. And I'm thankful that they helped me to realize the importance and the blessing that we could have by listening to wisdom counsel and experience. I'm thankful too, dear. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> you know, it starts a fatal cycle when young people at this age, and let me just say again, if you wait till your 14 year old daughter comes to you and says, I want to date because my best friend dates, you're behind the communication process. Mm -hmm. Okay. These kind of conversations starting there when they're already desiring to do it because they're already being influenced are a difficult starting point for this kind of conversation. You see, at that age, these 14 and 15 year olds that are involved in this, ask them how well they really manage a home. You know, at 14 and 15 years old, our young ladies, and our young men for that matter, should be taking responsibility in thoroughly working in home duties, mm -hmm. okay? Our 14 and 15 year olds need to be fully engaged in the educational process to become useful in this world and in the life to come. Amen. Our 14 and 15 year olds need to be focused on being responsible in their present home circles before they ever think about being out there dating because the sad thing is, is that many of those relationships that start at 14 and 15 and go on to three, four, five, six, a dozen relationships by the time they're 18 or 19, those young people are often the least prepared to cook a meal, the least prepared to care for a home, the least prepared to know how to shop for food. Do you understand what I'm saying? We need to be helping our young people recognize that at this age, that dating idea is as much a temptation as anything else around them that's wrong at that age. Do you agree with that? Amen. That may seem a little difficult for some, but that is a temptation at that age. That is not principle. It starts a fatal cycle that will break many hearts along the way. And we as parents need to break that cycle in the grace of God. If we don't, I'm going to share with you a simple yet painful story of the lessons that have to be learned from broken hearts. Can God heal broken hearts? Amen. Oh, yes. Thank the Lord. We all know that in one way or another, how God heals broken hearts. But this is a short illustration of a family, the parents, the broken-hearted parents, who allowed their mid-teens daughter too much freedom, who allowed her to get involved with a young man who in her mid-teens, began to give her affections to this young man. Their hearts got entangled. What happens when hearts get tangled? The reasoning power goes. Now, did this young girl understand all this? No. She might have read it somewhere. I think she probably did, but all that goes by the wayside. Reasoning gets set aside, and the, the affections get entangled. And her young heart got entangled, her affections the parents began to see what was happening and tried to pull back. The girl, unfortunately, at that point said she didn't want to pull back. And so her loyalties had switched. Whenever a young person in our home doesn't want to pull back, it means the loyalties have switched. It means they don't trust us as much as they trust this Another young person. man or this young woman. 
that's out there that's Mr. Wonderful or Mrs. Eve. <laughs> they no longer trust their parents. Their parents don't understand. You don't understand, Mom and Dad. And so all the loyalties had switched. They would not listen. She would not listen to the counsel of her parents. The parents then demanded that the relationship be cut off. She refused. She left home. You see the broken hearts along the way? And even today, years later, this family is still trying to mend broken hearts. It's tragic. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to go that way. If you see your young people, if I see one of my young people beginning to go in that direction with their emotions and their affections, because we're communicating, we need to do something about it and not let that continue to go unchecked because everybody else at school is doing it. I want to share with you a reference. It's taken from the book Letters to Young Lovers, page 45. It says, one of the greatest errors connected with this subject, this subject that we're talking about today, is that the young and inexperienced must not have their affections disturbed. Isn't that interesting? That there must be no interference in their love experience. If there ever was a subject that needed to be viewed from every standpoint, it is this. Take God and your God-fearing parents. Remember, this is written to young people. Take God and your God-fearing parents into your counsel, young friends, who are so well calculated to point out your dangers as your godly parents. Think about that. Young people, who better knows you than your parents? Mm -hmm. Who can understand your peculiar temperament as well as they? Children, listen to this, I quote, children who are Christians. Do we call ourselves Christians? Mm -hmm. Children who are Christians will esteem above every earthly blessing the love and approbation. That means the approval, the agreement of their God-fearing parents, end quote. We don't have to have broken hearts. We don't have to have God's heart broken. We don't have to have parents' hearts broken. We don't have to have the young people's hearts broken. Amen. Let's define true love. If we want that journey to an unbroken heart, then we need to understand what true love is. And by contrast, what the counterfeit is that we so often see. True love is a high and holy principle. Infatuation, by contrast, is misguided, uneducated feelings and emotions. True love looks beyond externals to the qualities of the character. Infatuation is attracted and then captivated by looks. True love is real. Infatuation tries to impress. True love remains calm. Infatuation is fiery. True love goes very deep. By contrast, infatuation is very shallow and superficial. True love will always show good judgment. Infatuation is always impetuous. True love will not only hear counsel, but true love will seek counsel. Infatuation is unreasonable and shuns counsel. I don't want to hear it. True love has good vision. It sees the strengths and it sees the weaknesses. Infatuation is blind and looks through rose-colored glasses. No, he's not like that at all. You don't understand, mom and dad. True love is careful and responsible. Infatuation is always careless and ends up being irresponsible. True love will speak wholesome, pure words. They will speak thoughtfully, and they will speak with wisdom. Infatuation speaks flirtatiously, suggestively, with flattery. Thoughtlessly, whatever comes into the, the thoughts. 
and often foolishly. True love will desire the truth, purity, and goodness above everything else. Infatuation. What's popular? What are my friends doing? How does everybody else do it? But I want it now, and I want a momentary pleasure just for a good time. True love is constant. It doesn't waver. And the infatuation is changeable as the wind. True love is strengthened through trial. Infatuation dies suddenly when it's even mildly tested. True love has direction for life. Infatuation is easily swayed one way or another by the person they're with. True love will have goals to obtain. Infatuation lives for the moment with much less a thought for tomorrow. True love is honest. It will exemplify integrity. Infatuation deceives, misleads, and lies to get what it wants. True love will be trusting. Infatuation controlling. True love will be restrained. Infatuation impulsive. True love will always, will always be guided by principle. Infatuation will always be driven by selfishness and lust. And we're going to pause right there. And we're going to take just a couple minute break and we're going to come back for part two where we'll talk about guidelines for a journey to an unbroken heart. Mm -hmm. 